think that the example that Jesus gave is the greatest example. We need to go and pray about it. We need to ask the Father what His will is concerning these situations that arise within the church. Please open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. Boy, we're moving through Matthew with lightning speed, aren't we? Feels like it. So this is a kind of a special moment in our study of the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. This is, uh, this is the time when Jesus called His 12 together, when He officially calls them together uh, to serve in a very, very special and unique way as far as uh, ministering to the people uh, in their area right there. So I just want to read, we're going to go through verse uh, 1 through 15 in chapter 10. Let me go ahead and read it to you and follow with me. It says, when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, the names of the twelve apostles were these, the first, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus and Libius, whose surname was Thaddeus, and Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Do not go to the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans do not enter, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, shoes, or even staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide until you leave. And when you come into a house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whatever, uh, and whoever will not receive you or to hear your words when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city." You may have noticed I'm reading from the old King James this morning, um, just kind of a, a nice little change. So in this passage, we find this group of men who were chosen, and in the beginning of our text, of course, in verse 1, it tells us he called uh, his 12 disciples. He had not commissioned them at this point yet to become apostles, and um, he gives these 12, these special, unique 12 men, um, a special calling. He calls them, and we will refer to them from that point forward as apostles, the 12 apostles. Luke gives us a little more, a uh, little bit different insight to this event that takes place. And there's what Luke adds here, I think, is very, very interesting. And it says in chapter 6 of Luke that, um, in those days, the times that were days that we're speaking of here, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. And he spent the night praying to God. And when the morning came, he called his disciples and chose 12 of them. So Luke doesn't inform us of this, but you know, the Lord spent time all night alone on the mountainside praying to his father about this 
this, this act that he was about to do, about choosing these 12 individuals that would lead pretty much out his ministry for years and years to come. Imagine if Jesus needed to go to the mountain to pray, if he needed to consult with the Father concerning the decisions that he was about to make, what does that say about our need to pray? I think a lot of times in our lives, things come across our path, and maybe we don't feel that, you know, we need to spend any time in prayer about it. And then later on down the road, as we see, maybe it falls apart or it didn't go the way we had planned, perhaps we would look back and we would say, oh, I should have prayed about that before I did anything. It just reminds me, if the Lord needed prayer, imagine how much more we need to be in prayer about things. And also, you can notice here in our text that, you know, there's no election that takes place here. There's no voting. He didn't pass ballots out among all the multitudes and say, vote for your favorite apostle candidate. None of that happened. He prayed, and then he acted. There was no congregational voting. There was None of that went on. And these 12, the number, why the number 12? Well, it's a very significant number to the Jews. And you want to remember, as we're going through Matthew, this gospel was written to the Jewish people. It was written in their tongue. It was written to them so that they might have their eyes open so they can say, this is the one that we've been waiting for. We know that many eyes were open during Jesus' ministry, but at the same time, many, many hearts were hardened also. You can imagine the the established religious power during the time of Jesus, how perhaps they felt maybe a little bit threatened by what he was doing. Maybe they didn't really agree with his methods, a little bit outside the box maybe for them, which I think is pretty cool to allow God to work outside the box when he wants to. But I'm sure there was some envy. There was some feelings of, we need to stop this guy. And we see that as, the, as our story progresses throughout these gospels, how they did respond. So Jesus uses this number 12, which in Jewish terms would, would be a constant reminder that he was the promised Messiah of Israel. And it's interesting that when Jesus commissions these men, he doesn't just say, go out into all the world and preach the gospel. This is a very limited, structured call from the Lord to these 12 men. And they were told to go only to the house of Israel, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, we read a few chapters back how Jesus looked upon the multitudes, how he felt about people, how he had a shepherd's heart toward people. And as he looked out among the multitudes in his heart, he was thinking they are like lost sheep without a shepherd. And truly they were because they had had nothing of truth and spirit in their lives. All they had was tradition, religion, rules, and oppression by those who ruled over them in the Jewish uh, culture, not let alone in the Roman culture also. So the word apostle, I just want to spend a minute talking about this. A lot of people get a little bit confused here, um, but the word apostle literally means messenger. So that doesn't mean your mailman is an apostle, right? But, but, but the word literally in the broadest view is that you or these these apostles, um, were messengers. And many times when, uh, well, like there was an offering taken from one church group maybe to send over to another church group that might have been um, struggling. And we know that Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians. And he, Paul talks about, he uses the word messengers, but when you look at the word messengers in that text, it's actually the word apostles. They were the sent out ones. 
um, apostles, the word apostle fell under the uh, idea of a missionary, someone who has been sent out on a specific task. And of course, the task that they're given in our text this morning is certainly the task of a missionary. Um, The servant, Jesus said, is not greater than the one who sent him. And when the word servant is translated, the word is actually apostle. So it has a very wide sense of um, interpretation in that sense. But there are these 12 unique men with a unique call. And the word apostle even it narrows down even a little bit more. Paul talked about this. Uh, Paul considered himself an apostle. He considered himself one called for the special task, perhaps the 12th apostle, because we know what happened with Judas, which only left 11. And so the big question was, who's going to fill his shoes? Who's going to take his spot? We can't have just 11. We need to have 12. Paul believed that he was called out of time, if you will, to be that 12th apostle. What did he base that upon? Well, he based it upon the fact that Jesus personally commissioned him to his job, if you will. Jesus appeared to him on the road, you remember, to Damascus? He appeared to Paul. And he told Paul, you're going to be my witness You're going to be doing my work. And it wasn't easy for Paul in his life. He had a difficult life, of course, once he gave it over to the Lord. Isn't that kind of opposite of what we hear so many times out there about things? Is your life difficult today? Are you dealing with, you know, finances and sickness? And just give your life to Jesus and everything's going to be wonderful, right? Well, you know, over and over and over again, and we're going to see this in living color here later on this morning, it doesn't mean because I'm a born-again believer in Jesus because I have been called by him to fill a destiny that he has, each one of us the same. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be rosy. It doesn't mean that I'm never going to get sick. It doesn't mean that I'm never going to struggle with one thing or another. I'm still a human. I still have human feelings. I still have, we all still have faults. That's the beautiful thing about the body of Christ. We love one another in spite of those faults, don't we? We learn to forgive. We learn to understand that, you know what? If Jesus saw enough value in you to die for you, I can find value in you also, no matter what your circumstance may be at the time. So entering into the Christian faith is not always entering into a life of prosperity and and, and easy uh, easy roads. As a matter of fact, if you look at each of these apostles and you look at uh, Paul, every single one of them had to give away everything they had. Paul goes as far as to say, I consider everything before Christ as dung, compared to the knowledge of Jesus in my life. Now, that was a lot for Paul. He was a scholar. He was a Pharisee. He was very well educated. He was very zealous towards the Jews, towards Israel, and toward God. And there were many years in Paul's life where he actually was the enemy of the church. He actually traveled around and persecuted churches with the authority that he had as a Pharisee. But it was the resurrected Lord who appeared to him. Now, I think that this is significant. Because what we find in in the book of Acts, when they are trying to locate a new number 12, if you will, some of the requirements that they were speaking of were somebody who had been around Christ during his teaching and somebody who had witnessed the risen Lord and somebody who had been personally commissioned by the risen Lord himself. Now, that really brings this term apostle down to a whole new level, doesn't it? It's not generalized in that sense. It's very specific 
to a very specific group of men being these 12. James was not one of the 12, and he was not a believer in Christ before the crucifixion, but he became a believer, and he was commissioned into his ministry. James became a great leader in the church. James was Jesus' half-brother. And we know from Scripture that James didn't believe in his brother as being the Messiah. It was just his brother. It was just Jesus. And sometimes that's the difficult part of, of our Christian life is, you know, we make these changes. We bring the Lord in. We allow him to rule and reign in our lives. And, you know, usually the first thing we want to do is we want to share that with our loved ones. We want to go to our family, our parents, our kids, our brothers, our sisters, and we want to tell them about this great thing that has happened in our lives. And God is using us, and he's given us peace. But sometimes those families, those people that know you might look at you and just say, I know that guy. I knew him for years. I knew what his past is. How can there be anything special about him? It's just my brother. I know my brother very well. And I think that perhaps James had the same problem when people were acknowledging him as the Christ. He was thinking, it's only my brother. Until he was crucified and he was seen by James. He was seen by James and he was seen by all of the apostles, Scripture tells us, which is very, very important. Um, so the question I think I would pose to us this morning do we have apostles today? Are there apostles today? Well, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that it's impossible that there would be apostles today. I'm sure that it's very possible that Jesus could appear to somebody, the resurrected Lord, and commission them personally to go out and do a job. But what of those people would have been ones who were around when Jesus was doing his ministry? That was part of the requirements. Well, that would be an answer zero, of course. Personally, I think that these 12 were unique in their calling. And although the word apostle may be generalized, as I said earlier, but when we come right down to it, these 12 were special and unique in their calling, one time only. As a matter of fact, it goes so far when we look in the book of Revelation in chapter 21, it tells us very interestingly that the walls of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles. I find that very interesting. So if there's more than 12 throughout history, then are their names going to be on pillars somewhere else? Well, the scripture doesn't say that. It only speaks of these 12 and of course, after Judas betrayed the Lord, since he was removed from his place, very interesting terminology there, they had to come together and figure out what they were going to do. We need a number 12. And so in Acts chapter 1, we read, therefore, they're saying this, they're, we need to choose of the men who have been, now there's the requirements, we need to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Beginning with John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And so they proposed two men, Joseph, who was called Barsabbas, and Matthias. And so here you have the leaders of the early church trying to figure out how they're going to fill that empty spot. They did have these specific requirements, someone who had been with us, somebody who saw him ascend into heaven, somebody who saw his resurrected, glorified body. And they had two candidates that they chose from, these two men. Now, remember, when Jesus chose the 12, he went on to a mountainside and prayed all night long. Well, we don't see that in the book of Acts. We see a great mistake here. It says they cast lots. They flipped the coin. They drew straws. The luck. It was all about that. There was no prayer. There was no anything that, like that that went into it. 
they cast lots, and the lot fell on Matthias. So he was added to the 11. So a lot would say, well, there's your 12th apostle. Well, I would ask the question, well, what did Matthias do? Where's the record of his ministry? What great things did he do in the early church? Well, there's no record of it. We don't know. You would think that if he was truly the one that God wanted to fill that spot, that he would have had a great ministry. He would have been spoken of in the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament. It's just not there. Today, in the time that we live in, in the churches, modern age churches, casting lots, in a sense, is still being done. There's still voting going on in churches as to what direction we should go. Well, how should we run our ministry? Who should we choose to be our leader? Oh, I didn't like that guy. I want to fire him, send him down the road, and we'll vote somebody else in. I think that the example that Jesus gave is the greatest example. We need to go and pray about it. We need to ask the Father what His will is concerning these situations that arise within the church. This is why we are a church that does not have congregational voting, because I don't believe it's scriptural. I don't think you see anything in the scripture that supports that, that becomes fruitful. And in this example we have here this morning is very clear. Now, on the other hand, a lot of people argue that it's Paul. He's the 12th. Even Paul himself in the book of Romans, he says this in chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. So Paul felt that he was the one who was called to be the 12th apostle out of due time, he says. I may have been an enemy of the church early on, but now... I am, I am part of the bride, and I've been commissioned, and I've been called. In Corinthians chapter 9, Paul said, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus, our Lord? And are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. You're the fruit of my ministry. You're the proof that God called me to be the apostle, the twelfth one. So today, of course, the debate continues. Who is the twelfth apostle? Well, you know, I guess someday we'll find out for sure, but I think that it's pretty clear from Scripture and from history that it was Paul who was called out in time uh, to become the successor uh, to succeed uh, Judas. Today in churches, there are churches today who are functioning and operating. One in particular is a huge church, large, large uh, church. And they claim to have 12 apostles. They claim that the ministry of apostleship is something that's handed down from one man to another. They claim that God had called these 12 men to be 12 apostles in their church. And even to this day, that's what they believe and that's what they practice. That kind of bothers me a little bit when I look at Scripture. You know, it doesn't really matter what people say. It doesn't really matter what kind of traditions are out there. It doesn't really matter what the uh, structure of a ministry might be. If it's not lined up with Scripture, then it's bad. It's wrong. It's an error. And oh, yeah, they may function and they may do great things. You know, I could take a counterfeit $100 bill and I could probably go down to the market this afternoon and spend it. I could buy groceries with it. I could bear fruit from that. I could bring good things into my life with that counterfeit $100 bill. And it would go on the till and it would be deposited in the bank. And eventually it would be sent out to somebody else and they could benefit from it. And all the benefits that you can gain from that, you know, in the bottom, in the end, it's still counterfeit. It's still fake. 
It's still not authentic. So just because a ministry or a group is giant and because they have such a great worldwide following doesn't necessarily mean that they're lined up with what God's will would be. They can still be counterfeit and do good things, but in the end, they are just phony. They're just cheap copies. They're counterfeit. Jesus built the foundation of the church upon these 12 apostles and the prophets. The foundation has already been laid 2,000 years ago. And the ministry of the apostles, as far as the 12 are concerned, it's a done deal. It's finished. There are no new foundations to be laid. We build upon the foundation that was laid in the early church. Now we have a list of these guys. I'm going to go down through this list. The names of the 12 were these. First, Simon, who was Peter. Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee. John, his brother. Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the publican. James, the son of Alphaeus and Libius, whose surname was Thaddeus. And then Simon, the Canaanite. That's pretty bizarre. And Judas, who betrayed him. So if you look at this list of men, you know, if you went to someone who was really, really religious, they would say, none of those guys really qualify. You have all different kinds of people here brought together with different ideas and, and different methodologies, if you will, in their lives, and Jesus is bringing them together. What about Judas? So you spent all night long on the hillside praying, and you choose a man that eventually betrays you? You ever thought about and think about that? Did Jesus make a mistake? Did the Father give him bad advice when he said, yeah, I'll go get Judas? As a matter of fact, make Judas the treasurer. Make him the one in charge of all your monetary stuff. And then he turns around and betrays him. You know, Judas fulfilled prophecy. Judas fell into a slot that was beyond Judas. Judas made his own choice, but yet God already knew the choice he would make. Thus, he was chosen. That's interesting to me because it would be very hard for me to choose somebody to help me with the church if I knew that a year from now they were going to betray me. That would be hard. That would be a difficult thing to do. But when Jesus is praying on the mountain and he comes down and he chooses these 12, every single one of them were chosen for a specific reason. None of these men were noble. None of them were really educated. None of them had social status. You know, by and large, these were just regular old common people. Aren't you glad about that? Aren't you glad that we're just ordinary common people and God can call us and use us too? I love that about it. Mostly they were fishermen. And mostly they were from the area of, of Galilee, of the Sea of Galilee. One of them, of course, we know Matthew was a tax collector. And we learned a couple of weeks ago, nobody liked Matthew because he was considered to be a traitor, but yet Jesus chose him. Now, Matthew had some interesting characteristics about him. He knew how to write. He knew how to use a pen. And he was a Jew. Thus, he writes the gospel of Matthew, the very first gospel that was ever written down. And it's written specifically to Matthew's people to show them Jesus is the one. He's the promised Messiah. Tax collector. Jesus chose him. Then there was Simon. He was a zealot. About 20 years before the ministry of Christ uh, began, there was a rebellion against Rome in Israel. And uh, Judea and Samaria were brought under this governmental control. Keep everybody in line, if you will. 
And evidently, Simon was part of that zealot group who rebelled against the Romans. So here's a guy that's on fire. Here's a guy that, that, that wants to change things by rebellion. He wants to change things by force. It's interesting that Jesus, being a man of peace, not a man of politics, would choose a political rebel to be one of his apostles. And, you know, there's Thomas. We know, we know about Thomas, the doubter. He was the kind of guy that demanded evidence. I won't believe it till I see it. There's a lot of people out there like that. I wonder if he chose Thomas to cover that group of people. There's a lot of people out there that will say, hey, you know what, you believe in God? Well, I'm not going to believe in God until I actually see him do something. Now, nine times out of ten, well, ten times out of ten, if somebody says that, then they're blind. Because all you got to do is look around and see what God is doing. It's not hard to see if you want to see it. But yet, Thomas, you remember Thomas. I need to put my, I need to see the nail marks. I need to put my finger in those nail holes. And I'm not going to believe until I see it. Now, Jesus could have just said, you know what, Thomas? You're fired. Everybody else here is all excited about me being resurrected. And what are you, Joe Pessimist? Right? No, Jesus didn't do that. He made a special appearance just for Thomas. Here, come here, Tom. Let me show you something here. Here's the nail holes. Here's my hole in my side. Here's the wounds from the crown. And then Thomas believed. As a matter of fact, Thomas said some four, uh, five words that have gone down through history. When he finally realized that this was the risen Christ, he said, you are my Lord and my God. That has been debated for 2,000 years, hasn't it? And it will continue to be debated. Jesus was just the son of God, wasn't he? He's just the Messiah, isn't he? Isn't he like lesser than God? No. We know this morning, as we come before the Lord and worship him, we're worshiping God. Thomas had that revelation. My Lord... And my God, and this is many, many times the very same revelation comes to us. When we've been running, when we've been living our own lives, going our own path. I've never seen God do anything miraculous in my life. I'm going to behave like Thomas did. And then suddenly the Lord does something in your life. Suddenly the Lord brings us to our knees, if you will. And one of the first things that comes out of our mouth is, my Lord and my God. A whole new way of living. And then, of course, Judas. The fact that Judas was chosen, you know, from the surface, from a fleshly, from an intellectual view, I suppose we would think, wow, that was not a good choice. But he was fulfilling God's plan. So when we look around, sometimes we see other people are coming into the faith and we say, oh, man, even if they maybe do you wrong down the road. You know, it's heartbreaking, isn't it, when that happens? It's sad. But you know that God can even use people like that in our lives to help us grow? He can use anything in your life to help you grow. It doesn't all have to be roses and good news. There can be a lot of bad news going on out there, and the Lord can use that to cook out some of that flesh that we carry around with us. Help us to see things through the eyes of the Lord more than through our own eyes. He chose these people even though they weren't popular or desired by others. I think that's a very significant thing this morning for us to understand. He tells them when you go out, he gives them this ministry, and he says, when you go out, I want you to preach. Now, when you preach, you're declaring something. You're declaring the gospel. Someone asked me a while back, what's the difference between preaching and teaching? You know? Well, you know, I've been thinking about it. I've been really, I mean, it's kind of hard to really define right down the middle because 
There are times when that's, I'm a preach, teaching pastor, and there's times I find myself up here preaching at you. You know, so I think sometimes the two kind of meld together. Sometimes when I go to another place, like maybe the mission or a jail or a prison, and I find myself there, I find myself evangelizing, mixing that in with a teaching or preaching, you know. But preaching is a proclamation of something, and teaching is explaining what that proclamation means. That's the big difference. But they are married together. They go hand in hand. So he gives them specific instructions to go to the house of Israel. Don't go among the Gentiles. Now, later on in our gospel, when Jesus is being ascended into heaven, he's going to change that commission, isn't he? He's going to say, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. To the Gentiles. And do you know that that wasn't plan B? That from day one, from the very, very beginning, God intended to allow us Gentiles to be a part of salvation? But at this particular time, he was the promised Messiah to Israel. Now, if you go back in history and you look around different parts of the world, things that might have been going on during the time of Christ 2,000 years ago. There were other people who were considered prophets, leaders in different areas geographically in the world. You know, Israel's a very small place. And when you look at it in light of the size of the planet, it's really small. But what did God tell Abraham? Abraham. It's your offspring, Abe. Those are the ones I'm going to bless. And anybody who blesses you, I'm going to bless them. And anybody who curses you, I'm going to curse them. They were a specific group of people. Were they perfect? Well, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, it's real frustrating to read the Old Testament and to see almost every single generation how they stumbled and fell and backslid and went back to worshiping false gods, how they caved in to peer pressure, to the wisdom of the world, I guess you might want to say today. They were a very unique group of people, and they were given promises by God the Father. But even at the same time in the Old Testament, it speaks of the whole world and all nations coming together to know this great and only true God. There are no prophets. There are no leaders. There are no historical figures who can make that claim except for Christ. You want to go visit Buddha? Well, you can go to his tomb, and you might be able to peek at his bones. You want to visit other leaders like that? Eastern, South American, you know, whatever. Aztec, whatever. It doesn't matter. When those leaders died, they were dead. There's only one who defeated death. There's only one who rose from the dead. There's only one who proved to us and to history, to the whole world who he truly was, the promised Messiah of Israel. Now, you and I this morning are sitting here, and we are very blessed to be part of God's people. You know, the Bible even explains it to us. It tells us we've kind of been grafted in, like you graft a branch into a tree. Gosh, I've seen trees where they bear like pears and apples because they've grafted in these different branches into a tree. Well, you and I have been grafted in too. We've been grafted into the tree of Israel in a sense. We've been grafted into the tree of God's people. And Paul, as he's explaining that, is very careful to remind us, if you could be grafted in, you can also be grafted out too. <clears throat> so we never, we never find ourselves getting heady about this. We find ourselves humbly accepting God's mercy, humbly being thankful that it didn't just stop with Israel, that it went out to all nations throughout the world. The promised Messiah was totally Jewish. The commission was totally Jewish. 
He wanted them to go to the lost sheep of Israel. And he gives them some instructions here that are kind of interesting. He says to heal the sick, to preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand, to raise the dead, cast out devils. He says, because freely you have received, freely give. They didn't go out and have giant crusades and pass a basket around to get money from everybody before the speaker would speak. They didn't have great promotional things. They weren't into it for monetary gain. They did everything they did for free. And Jesus is teaching them a very, very important lesson on this first missionary journey that they're about to embark on. Where God guides, God provides. That's the lesson. You don't need to take an extra jacket. You don't need to take money. You don't need to take a, a, a sword. You don't even need an extra pair of shoes. You just go. And as you go and as you visit different places, people will take care of you. That very same principle has funneled all the way down into the church today. As we go, we go with only the expectation that God is leading us and guiding us and that he's going to provide for what we need in order to fulfill his calling in our lives. Amen? Don't you believe that? I do. I believe that the things of the gospel should not have a price tag on them. Now, if you want to buy my CDs from this service today, you can pick it up for $10.99. No. It's free. It should be free. Freely, freely you have received, freely give. Not only monetarily, but of our time, of our talents, of our gifts. We give it freely. We do it because we love the Lord and we love God's people. This was a very limited structured ministry for these men to go to the lost sheep. And he says, as you're traveling around and you go into a city, look for a home that you might be able to go into that would be worthy. Well, by worthy, I think he's saying that would be accepting of you. A home that might be wanting your message to go out. Or even a city that might be wanting to hear your message, a city that might be hungry to hear good news for a change. But he said, but if you go into that city and you walk into that house and they're antagonistic against you, you just don't get the good vibes, you, you recognize that the spirit that's there is not the spirit of God. Jesus just said, hey, leave. Gather up your peace and go somewhere else. Go to another place where you'll be accepted, where you'll be encouraged, where you'll be appreciated for the message that you're going to bring. In verse 13, he says, if, your house, if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return. And whoever shall not receive you or hear your word when you depart that house or city, shake the dust off your feet. Now, that's kind of a saying that has floated down through history. If you reject me, I'm just going to shake the dust off my feet. Well, I don't know. I don't know that Jesus is saying that to you and me this morning. Was this just a specific thing for these apostles during this ministry that they were, this mission that they were sent on? You know what I believe? I believe you don't ever give up on people. I know for a fact that there was a time in my life where people gave up on me. He'll never do anything. He'll, he'll always be what he is. And You know, it's only the living God that can come into a person and change a person's life to that extent. It's only Jesus having a relationship with him that can change a person to that extent, to pull them up out of the pit and use them. And he does that over and over and over again. That's why we don't see any special educated people being called by Jesus here this morning. Matter of fact, a lot of them had a lot of faults. You know, Peter had hoof and mouth disease, right? He always opened his mouth before he thought. They all had their own specific little flaws. And so do we, each one of us. 
But the Lord calls us just the same, which is, what an honor, huh? Now, Sodom and Gomorrah, he mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah here. Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't really a place that the gospel was being preached. As a matter of fact, Sodom and Gomorrah was living under a atmosphere of uh, total evil and ungodliness. And it was existing in a time when God, the Father, and Jesus really weren't revealed to the world as they are today. And that's why Jesus is saying it's going to be more tolerable for them. It's going to be more, uh, it's going to be easier on them than it's going to be on you if you reject him. Because now we're accountable. With knowledge comes accountability, right? And now that we know, you can't unknow. Now that we know, we have to be accountable for what we know, and we have to stand accountable for what we know. What a horrible thing it would be to have to stand before the Lord and and hear the words, I never knew you. You rejected me. I never knew you. I'm sorry, but when we find, if somebody finds themselves in that place, there's no cure. There's nowhere else to go. You've rejected the only source that God has provided for us to make it in eternal life with God. He's the only source. I'm going to take a couple of minutes here before we close. You ever wonder... What happened to the apostles? You ever wonder? I'm going to just share a few historical facts with you this morning before we close. We know about Andrew. He was uh, Peter's brother, and he lived in Capernaum. He was a fisherman. Andrew uh, found himself in Acacia and in Greece, ministering, being a missionary. Um, he went to the town of Patra. Andrew died as a murder, martyr. Now, what happened with Andrew? Well, Andrew went into these different countries, and he was in uh, a place called Patra. And the governor there, his wife, was healed of a sickness by Andrew. And when his wife was healed from the sickness, she converted to the Christian faith. And when she converted to the Christian faith, shortly after that, the governor's brother became a Christian. And the governor, Appius, was very angry. And so he had Andrew arrested. And he condemned him to die on the cross. He was crucified. But with Andrew, it was different. He didn't feel worthy to be crucified on a cross like Jesus was. He was crucified on a cross that was shaped like an X because he didn't feel worthy to die the way his Lord died. And so Andrew was a martyr for the Lord. And one of the signs for St. Andrew is the cross. And uh, a symbol of a cross and fish has been uh, uh, attributed to him because he was a fisherman. Now then we have Nathaniel, or Bartholomew, if you will. He lived in Cana. Tradition says that he was a missionary in Armenia. A lot of scholars believe that he was the only disciple who came from royal blood. His family, his, his name means the son of Tolmai. And Tolmai was the king of Geshur. And history goes back. Tolmai, the king of Geshur, whose daughter Maka was the wife of David. So we see this, how it goes all the way back. And this woman, Maka, was the mother of Absalom, who was David's son. So this fellow, Bartholomew, he has quite a bloodline. His name is found in every list. He preached with Philip in Persia and Armenia. The Armenian church said that he was the founder of the church there. Tradition tells us that his death took place. He died a martyr for his Lord. And you know how he died? He was filleted alive. Ah. Boy. You know, sometimes we complain about the dumbest little things. And yet these men, they were, they were, he's willing to, to lay there and be filleted alive. All you got to do is just deny the Lord. 
Just say that it's a hoax and you'll live. James, he was a great man of courage and forgiveness. He was a man that didn't have jealousy. He was the first of the 12 to become a martyr. And um, he was put to death uh, in, in the book of Acts. We read about Acts chapter 12. He was the member of the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. James the Lesser was another one. He was the son of Alphaeus. And according to tradition, this is the man who wrote the epistle of James. He preached in Palestine. Tradition tells us that he died as a martyr and his body was sawed into pieces. A saw became his apostolic symbol. John, um, the son of Zebedee, he, uh, well, we know a lot about John. He wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. They tried to silence him on several occasions, couldn't do it. They tried to poison him. They tried to boil him in oil. The guy wouldn't die. He lived and died of old age. Natural causes, if you will. Judas Iscariot, the traitor, well, we know what happened to him. He hung himself. And then Jude, Thaddeus is another name for, for Jude. Um, he was a very, like I said earlier, he was a nationalist. He was the one that had the dream of world domination by the Jewish nation. God, God chose him to be one of his 12. And he didn't understand the whole concept of a suffering savior. Jude went to preach the gospel in the, by the Euphrates River. He healed many people, and many people believed in him. He was killed with arrows at the city of Ararat. And so the chosen symbol for him is a ship because he was a missionary. Matthew, or Levi, the man who wrote our book that we're studying, um, Matthew, um, the son of Alphaeus, we don't know a whole lot about Matthew personally, except the fact that he was a publican. He was engaged in public service. And Matthew, unlike most of the other apostles who were fishermen, he was able to write. He was able to record facts. And he recorded our gospel that we're studying in the Hebrew language. Um, it tells us that he was a missionary. And um, the apostolic symbol for Matthew was three money bags, which remind us that he was a tax collector. He, too, was martyred or murdered, if you will, for the faith. Peter. Peter was martyred and killed for his faith. His symbol is a uh, cross that's upside down. He was crucified upside down, much like the other apostle who didn't feel worthy to be crucified on a regular cross, so they turned it upside down and killed him on that. See, these men, didn't they meet wonderful endings? prosperity and wealth and popularity everywhere they went. I think this is a wake-up call. When we see what history tells us about some of these men and what happened to them, it's a wake-up call. Then there's Simon the Zealot. He's another one. He's a Canaanite. Wow. That's very interesting. He lived in Galilee, and he also was crucified for his faith in Jesus Christ. And finally, we have Thomas, Thomas the doubter. Thomas was kind of like a little child. His first reaction was not to do what he was told to do and not to believe what he was asked to believe unless he could see proof of it. It is said that he was commissioned to build a palace for the king of India. He was killed by a spear as a martyr for his Lord. And so his symbol is spears, stones, and arrows. So we can see from this little history lesson this morning that these men who are being commissioned to go out and preach the gospel to the lost house of Israel, their future, their immediate future maybe didn't seem so bright. Now right now I can confidently say that they're in the presence of Jesus Christ right now. And their future, eternally future, is very bright. Amen. But the problem here this morning is if I can't release some of these tiny little issues in my life and count the cost for being a disciple, you know, I'm shamed when I look at some of these guys and what happened to them and how I'll snivel over the most menial little things that go on around. And I'm a good sniveler, right? I'm a complainer sometimes. 
I have a nickname, Eeyore. <laughs> but here's my point this morning. Are we willing to count the cost too? Are we willing to say, Lord, I'll do anything for you, even if it costs my job, even if it costs my home or my life? I'll do anything for you, Lord. So this morning, let's have our worship team come on up. This morning, I want to tug on your heart a little bit. I want us to be able to take just a moment and evaluate where we are in our personal relationship with the Lord. It's real easy to become lukewarm. It's real easy to be caught in a routine. And you know what? I believe that the Lord doesn't want us to be stuck in a routine. I believe he wants things to be fresh in our relationship with him. Maybe you're feeling a little routine this morning. Maybe you're feeling a little lukewarm. Maybe you would like to maybe come before God this morning and just say, Lord, I want to repent. You know, I haven't been on fire. i kind of been here and there, half in and half out. I really haven't been willing to sacrifice these things that I know you've been asking me to sacrifice. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in us to be able to do these things. Perhaps you need prayer. I want to encourage you. Over here, these two wonderful ladies over here, they want to pray with you this morning. And by the way, both of their husbands are home sick today. Lonnie and Lonnie, they're both sick. I don't know if it's the name or what, but pray for them, you guys. But if you need prayer this morning, please come over, even while we're singing these last two songs. And by the way, I want to thank you guys. That was awesome worship time this morning. What a blessing. Yeah. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you this morning. Lord, when we look at these men who you chose, what a diverse group of people. And Lord, in this room this morning, we have a great diverse group of people. But we know this morning that you also have chosen us. You have called each and every one of us in this room to be your children, to be your part of your bride, part of your church. And you've given each and every one of us gifts, talents. God, help us. Help us, Lord, to unlock those things in our lives. Help us this morning to count the cost. Help us, Lord, in these crazy times that we find ourselves living in right now to understand that we were born during this time of history on purpose, that we were born for a time such as this. And so, Lord, help us to let go and to grab onto you and follow you no matter what. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful time that we get to just learn, learn you more, Lord, and, and get to know you more, Lord. And Lord, we want to be more like you. That is what you want us to be. And Lord, we want to lift you up today. We're reminded that uh, we need to prepare the way for you, Lord, for a highway for our God. And Lord, we want to do this each and every day, uh, be able to spread your good news to everyone and everywhere we go. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed week, everybody.